Juan Zarate is chairman and co-founder of the Financial Integrity Network, the senior national security analyst for CBS News, and a visiting lecturer of law at the Harvard Law School. He also serves as chairman and senior counselor for the Foundation for Defense of Democracy Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance, a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC, and a senior fellow to the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Uh, Juan Zarate served as deputy assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor for combating terrorism from 2005 to 2009 and was responsible for developing and implementing the U.S. government's counterterrorism strategy and policies relating to transnational security threats. He was the first ever Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, where he led domestic and international efforts to attack terrorist financing. The innovative use of Treasury's national security-related powers and the global hunt for Saddam Hussein's assets. Mr. Zarati is a former federal prosecutor who served on terrorism prosecution teams prior to 9-11, including the investigation of the USS Cole attack. He's earned numerous awards for his work, including the Treasury Medal. He sits on numerous boards. He has a number of publications and is regularly featured in the New York Times, Financial Times, The Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Just this morning, as I was listening to NPR, he was the featured national security commentator on the situation in Brussels. His book, Treasury's War, The Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare, is our selection as the book of the semester for winter semester 2016. Uh, Mr. Zorati has his own weekly column, <clears throat> uh, National Security Program on cbsnews.com called Flashpoints. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School and a former Rotary International Fellow in Salamanca, Spain. Uh, he is here, as I mentioned, as part of our book of the semester Please join me in welcoming Mr. Juan Zarate. Corey, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank the Center for hosting me. Um, and I want to thank uh, Jeff for your leadership of the Center. Uh, most uh, thankfully, I want to thank my good friend and former colleague, uh, Fred Axelgard. Uh, who is one of the great American patriots and servants uh, that, that I've witnessed, uh, who embody the, the essence of ethical service in the U.S. government. And I learned so much from Fred, and I'm honored to be here in his presence, and, and really <clears throat> honored to be here at BYU. Um, I've always admired BYU, uh, always admired the LDS and the work that you do, not just here in Utah, not just in the country, but all around the world, and the important role that this university and, and the church plays. Um, one quick note, and I think it's important, uh, especially in light of the, the prayer, uh, I think our hearts uh, and, and minds and our prayers go out to the families of those who've been hurt in the uh, incidents in Brussels, and in particular the, the missionaries who were uh, injured. Uh, so our, my prayers and my thoughts go out to their families, and I, if any of you know uh, those families or <clears throat> know those missionaries, please let them know that my thoughts are with them and certainly everyone in Washington are thinking about them. But I want to also uh, reflect a little bit on, on the center because uh, David Kennedy was also a great public servant. Uh, and I'm honored that the book Treasury's War has been selected as uh, uh, the book of the semester. And apropos, given that uh, uh, Secretary Kennedy was one of our great secretaries of the Treasury uh, and was not only an ambassador for the United States, but an ambassador for the, for the church and uh, was an important uh, American uh, patriot and, and uh, advocate for U.S. power. So I'm honored that you've selected this book. If some of you have read it, thank you. Uh, for those of you who want to pick it up, there are pictures in the book. So if you don't want to actually read it, you can kind of get a sense of the book. In the middle, there's some good pictures. Fred, no pictures of you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I also want to just uh, say a word of thanks. I've, I've reflected on this before, but uh, Senator Hatch, who I know is a graduate of this uh, university, uh, I'm a huge fan of his. And part of the reason I'm a huge fan of his is when I was going through my confirmation hearings, uh, I got sort of tied up in a lot of the politics of confirmation hearings, as you often uh, see, and it was a tussle between committees as to who would have ownership of my position and, and of the confirmation hearing. But Senator Hatch was always gracious, and as we were going through the confirmation process, he was actually very gracious with my parents. Uh, and I remember he came during the, the confirmation hearing itself down from up uh, where the senators sit to go greet my parents 
He gave my mother a great big hug and my father a handshake and showed them great respect. Uh, and I'll always remember that and I'm always grateful for that. So Senator Hatch has a really sort of special place in my heart. So all that said, I'm honored to be here, really am. And uh, I want to thank Fred again for, for hosting and, and for the, the invitation initially. What I want to talk to you about is the theme of, of the book, which is the central role of financial and economic power in our national security. Um, and as you know from reading the book and from, frankly, just reading the newspaper, our use of financial and economic power has now taken pride of place in most of the key national security issues of the day. And so all you need to do is look at uh, the issues du jour that are facing the country, whether it's with respect to terrorism, uh, whether it's with respect to how to deal with Russian aggression, whether it's how to deal with the Iranian nuclear program and the unwinding of the sanctions uh, around that program, or how to deal with North Korean belligerents uh, and their nuclear program and missile program. Uh, or how to deal with transnational organized crime that impacts uh, national security and issues of corruption in places like Mexico and other places. Issue after issue, the question of how we use economic power and influence is now central to the discourse. And I remember back when Fred and I were working together, when Fred was at the State Department, and when the Department of Homeland Security was created in 2003, when I was sitting at, at Treasury, the question was often, why Treasury was even at the table, because the classic sense of national security was about the big boys and girls of national security being the State Department, the Department of Defense, the CIA, the FBI. Uh, Treasury wasn't a part of that discussion or dialogue. But by the time I left the White House, when I was uh, honored to serve as the, the DNSA, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Combating Terrorism, in 2009, the question was actually flipped. The question was often at the hardest moments of decision making in the Situation Room or the Oval Office. The question was, where is the Treasury Department? What strategies and tools can they bring to bear to deal with, with these hard issues? And that was the reality of this shift, shift in the use of financial and economic power and a realization that this was a central form of power for the U.S. government uh, and for our national security. And so if you think about national tools and national strategies, you often think about the hard edges of kinetic power and military power, or the very good and important work of diplomats and diplomacy. But what lies in between are often other elements of suasion and power. But central to that is economic and financial power. How do we use the might of the American economy, the importance of American capital markets, the chief role of the dollar as the chief reserve and trade currency around the world, all as elements of influence and shaping as we think about national security. And in this period post 9-11, the thought was not only how do we think about this power, but how do we use it in ways to isolate rogue actors in the international system? How do we use it to undermine the ability of America's enemies to actually access the international financial and commercial system. Understanding that any enemy of the United States has to have access to money. They need, if they want to bring fruition to their wild imaginings and actually want to threaten U.S. national security interest, actually need access to the financial system. They need bank accounts. They need credit. They need access to commercial systems. They need to ship things around the world. And so in order to isolate them, the strategy was to begin to think about how to unplug them from that system. And this was an evolution from the strategy of old of the use of sanctions, which dates back to the Peloponnesian War, the use of isolation of trade routes or uh, isolating access to key ports or interests. You know, that's been a part of warfare for since the dawn of man. Uh, but the reality in a, in a post 9 11 environment, in an age of globalization, was a question of how we could use these tool, tools more smartly, how we could use them to isolate these actors. And we know, interestingly, from what the targets of these new tools and strategies, we know from what they say and the effects of them what they've actually meant, that they're actually different from the sanctions of old. These aren't the, the old sanctions of the use of trade 
uh, isolation or hermetically sealing countries like the Iraq sanctions or the Cuba sanctions. These are very different sanctions. And if you listen and you watch to what has happened in the environment, you see why this is different. and You understand what has happened. In the raids of Abbottabad, when bin Laden was found and killed, uh, the Navy SEALs actually collected a treasure trove of documents. Some of the documents included memos of bin Laden musing and thinking about the financial position of Al Qaeda and its network. And one of the things he reflected on in one of the memos was the fact that Al Qaeda could no longer raise or move money the way that they once did. In fact, he began to think and speculate that Al Qaeda should start to move to a kidnap for ransom model in a way that uh, mimicked what the Taliban was doing or Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb was doing in North Africa uh, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars as a way of raising money. And so Al Qaeda itself and other terrorist networks have felt the sting and the pressure of this isolation. When the North Koreans felt this new form of power and isolation in 2005, they actually told the chief White House negotiator at the time, you finally found a way to hurt us. And I'll explain that in just a bit. And even the Iranians understood that they were under financial pressure. They called it the most uh, significant attack on the revolution uh, since its founding in 1979. They called it the hidden war on the regime. So much so that President Rouhani, after the nuclear deal was signed, said openly and was willing to admit that Iran was being sanctioned back into, in his words, the economic stone age. And even Russia, despite the fact that President Putin with his braggadocio isn't willing to admit the fact that he's being affected by these measures, has had to come to terms with the effects of this isolation in addition to the drop in oil prices with stagnating growth, challenges to their reserves, very real challenges to their financial institutions and their connectivity and their access to long-term capital. That's real world impact and effect. And so the enemies and the targets of these measures have felt their impact. And this, is, this forms part of a new approach to the use of these tools. And let me just explain that a bit and explain it in the context of what happened post 9-11, because that's important. And then what I want to do with you is talk a little bit about some current events and how these tools impact what's happening in the world. And so it's important, though, to, to have context for, for what has happened. Now, this new approach, as I said, is not the sanctions of old, where sanctions were neatly tied to diplomacy and were neatly tied to trade and commerce. Instead, these sanctions are an attempt to unplug actors from the international financial and commercial system and to use the very fact that these actors are, in fact, rogue financial actors, rogue commercial actors, that they are engaged in some form of illicit finance or activity that subjects them or should subject them to scrutiny and isolation and questions in the international system. And so if you look at the sanctions that are now being implemented, they are being implemented largely around conduct-based activities, terrorist financing, proliferation financing, human rights abuses, corruption, even cyber-enabled malicious activity. And so the new sanctions of the 21st century have much more to do with conduct as opposed to territory or even regime. Secondly, the, the sense that the role of the dollar is central to how we think about sanctions. They always have been, but in a much more fundamental way. Because at the end of the day, any global institution that wants to have not only access to banks and capital, but wants international reach and legitimacy has to be able to do business in the United States, has to be able to do business in dollars, and for purposes of sanctions, actually has to be able to deal in dollar-related transactions, has to have access to the U.S. banking system. That is real power and potential influence. And in the post-9-11 environment, the reality that reputational risk is actually a key form of risk calculus for any financial or commercial institution. This was seen explicitly in the post 9-11 environment, for example, in the case of Riggs Bank. Once the storied institution in Washington, I've got a great old picture of, of the bank branch uh, of Riggs Bank from the 1920s on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue that sits, used to sit right across from the Treasury Department. 
And what was interesting was this bank once called itself the most important bank in the most important capital of the world. The problem was, in 2005, they came under great scrutiny by their regulators, by investigators, and also by the media as to whether or not Riggs Bank had anti-money laundering controls and sanctions controls in place, and whether or not they had facilitated activity to include activity that financed the Saudi hijackers who were part of 9-11. And maybe they helped hide some of Pinochet's assets from Chile. And maybe they were helping with corrupt regimes out of Equatorial Guinea and others to move money uh, in and out of the U.S. system. And so once the revelations were made in the press and once the investigations were underway, Riggs fell by the weight of the reputational impact of those allegations. By 2006, Riggs was no more, uh, causing havoc in the embassy banking world because they had held all of the embassy bank accounts in Washington. Uh, and that institution across from the Treasury turned into a PNC bank and is no longer. If you walk along Pennsylvania Avenue, you won't see evidence of a Riggs bank. They fell by the weight of the reputational uh, impact and environment of the day. And this new approach also relied explicitly and importantly on the role of the private sector. This wasn't just a, a reflection of the private sector being uh, a regulated set of actors, the banks, the insurance companies, the brokers and dealers, which are now subject to more anti-money laundering regulations under the Patriot Act or post 9-11. But this was a reflection that the banks and financial institutions and others were actually the gatekeepers of this international financial and commercial order that if they themselves took on the role of assessing risk, of evaluating rogue activity, took more centrally to their risk calculus how they thought about doing business around the world, that they themselves, not the U.S. government, not the EU, not the U.N., they themselves would make decisions to exit clients, to decide not to do business, to ask hard questions of key actors for rogue regimes and potentially rogue non-state networks. And so all of that formed part of a new approach, a new way of using sanctions and pressure. And in the post-9-11 era where we were mandated, Fred and I were part of this environment, to use all elements of national power to undermine al-Qaeda and related terrorist groups' ability to raise and move money around the world, this now became a new form of power. It was part partly due to new forms of financial intelligence, everything from the pocket litter of a terrorist and the receipts found in a terrorist safe house, to the high-level bank wires between global institutions and the SWIFT terrorist financing tracking program that we created between the Treasury and the SWIFT bank messaging system. These new tools of the ability to not only go after the assets of the leaders of these groups, like Osama bin Laden or Ayman al-Zawahiri or Sheikh Saeed al-Masri, the Egyptian accountant, who actually reviewed all the receipts and accounts of the operatives within al-Qaeda. He wasn't a very liked man, by the way. Um, that financial intelligence and tools could be used uh, to go after the financial infrastructure of these groups, and not just those that were directly supporting, but those that were indirectly supporting or financially facilitating their activity. And then the enforcement that was part of this, this, this element that regulators and and uh, prosecutors and investigators were looking at these issues closely. And as well, a new form of financial diplo diplomacy, uh, something that David Kennedy himself sort of espoused and, and embodied, the notion that Treasury and the central bank uh, and those with economic uh, backgrounds and influence actually had a role to play, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And so suddenly, finance ministries and central banks around the world had a key role and voice to play in national security. I like to remind folks that uh, every Secretary of the Treasury that I dealt with uh, told me and, and uh, said openly that they were relieved that they were, uh, that they had the backing of Alan Greenspan, uh, the, the, the Chairman of the Fed, for some of the measures that we were taking, including this financial intelligence program that we'd created with SWIFT. That if Alan Greenspan had not been behind it and had not been an advocate for this program, both internal to the U.S. government and with his central bank counterparts, that the Treasury secretaries would not have wanted to move forward. And so a whole new form of financial diplomacy, 
And so this was a whole new set of tools, a whole new environment, and a whole different recognition that power could be used uh, in a different way. Now let me take with the remaining time I have to talk through some current events and how this power is being used and frankly how it's being challenged. Uh, because at the tail end of my book, what I try to talk about in Chapter 16, The Coming Financial Wars and the Epilogue, is that what we've done in this post-9-11 era has been incredibly effective, uh, has been deemed to be some of the most important national security steps we've taken uh, in the last 15 years. But it's just the beginning of the story uh, because we are now in a period of financial and economic influence and warfare in a globalized environment where it's not just the U.S. that's a, a prime actor, but now other actors are at play. And other actors realize that the U.S. and our allies actually have vulnerabilities in this same system, vulnerabilities that can be exploited or leveraged uh, for their purposes. So let me talk through uh, five areas that I think are of interest, and I'm happy in the Q&A period to talk about others if you'd like. The first is with, with respect to ISIS. And again, we've, we've seen the growing reach uh, and capability of a group uh, that many in Washington had, I think, naively and hopefully thought was isolated to a more local program of creating a caliphate in the Middle East and, frankly, wouldn't be willing to attack the West unless provoked. I think that's now an orthodoxy and a narrative that is, uh, has died by the weight of the tragedies of what we've seen in Paris and now Brussels and certainly the continued threat of potential networks operating in Europe. But the reality is from a financing perspective, and you hear this from uh, politicians, from Treasury Secretaries, from finance ministries around the world, there's a deep recognition that we have to find a way to undermine the ability of the Islamic State and other groups, elements of al-Qaeda that continue to operate, their ability to raise and move money, because they're still able to raise and move money in ways that allow them to do things like what we've witnessed in Brussels. But the environment has shifted, and they have adapted to the pressure. In many ways, these terrorist networks are more localized, taking advantage of local economic opportunities. I mentioned earlier al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, making an industry of kidnap for ransom to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, you have the al-Shabaab movement connected to al-Qaeda, which developed a very sophisticated export of coal and import of sugar as a part of their fundraising mechanism, their financing, their economy. Uh, that's part of the reason why when the Kenyan troops went into uh, uh, Somalia with force, they went in and took away the port of Kismayo, which was a key economic resource for uh, the al-Shabaab network. And it's also why the UN, when they passed sanctions with respect to sanctions, passed a, a trade sanction with respect to the export of charcoal uh, from Somalia uh, and, and import of sugar. And so these Groups have grown more localized. They've figured out how to use the local economy to their benefit. And they're more fragmented. They've developed local and regional economies and facilitation networks that have allowed them to operate. And in the case of ISIS, which is attempting to govern, which looks like an insurgency, like a terrorist group, and also like a proto-state uh, entity, they've actually figured out how to develop a diversified war economy. They've used oil and oil smuggling to raise millions of dollars. This explains why the U.S. military and our coalition have tried to hit elements of their infrastructure to include mobile refineries. They've used their control of food granaries and uh, key elements of the economy, water and food, as a way of raising money. They impose taxes and extortion. They still sit and control the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul. Um, and so they are able to raise taxes when they need to, just like a governing entity uh, to raise funds for their operatives or for their strategic plans. Uh, they use the antiquities trade. And so in one hand, they destroy the very notion of cultural heritage uh, and diversity, but they use elements of uh, that cultural heritage as well to profit. And so initially, something that they're taxing at one-fifth of the amount, they actually had a, a tax system around this, they actually then took over, hiring their own crews and their own uh, elements of the economy to actually then run the trade. And so they rely on an economy that is largely cash-based but also relies on elements of the financing. 
And interestingly, in this context, where terrorist groups operate territory in real uh, economies, they're actually able to not only use the economy to profit, but as a defensive shield. So this explains why we aren't shutting down with regulation all of the banks in Iraq. We don't want the people to starve, starve and we don't want the economy to suffer. Uh, it's why when we've done targeted strikes of economic uh, resources, we've been very targeted to include those video images, I'm not sure if you've seen it, of the U.S. military hitting these cash centers that the Islamic State has used to dole out cash. In fact, there's a great video out uh, of one of the targets where the bombs explode and you see cash flying into the air. And so those are the kinds of targets that are hit, but these groups understand that there is no willingness to actually destroy the economy, destroy the infrastructure, and so they've used that to their benefit as a defensive economic shield. And so how then do you use these tools against an enemy that has developed a local economy, that is embedding with local brokers and regional economies, um, that is engaged in trade and oil, even with its enemies, as with the Assad regime and the Islamic State as they deal in oil together. How then can you use these financial tools? I'm not going to answer the question. I'm going to raise questions. With respect to North Korea, you've seen the new uh, sanctions resolution passed by the UN, a great uh, step of uh, economic diplomacy uh, between the U.S. Uh, and the rest of the world, including China, to impose the strictest sanctions we've seen on North Korea to date, at least from the UN. But it's a reflection of the fact that we continue to struggle with the question of how we affect the regime behavior from Pyongyang and how can we use economic tools and influence to actually affect the trajectory of their nuclear program or their ballistic missile program, especially as they continue to advance in that way. Let me reflect just a moment, though, uh, on the comment I, I uh, suggested came from the North Koreans themselves when they said in 2005, you finally found a way to hurt us. Because in that period, what we had done was we had mapped out where North Korea actually had financial relationships and dependencies outside of North Korea. Because the common orthodoxy in Washington had long been that there was nothing that could be done to or with North Korea. This was the hermit kingdom. And, and for God's sakes, we didn't trade with North Korea. Their leadership didn't come to Los Angeles or San Francisco or Madison Avenue or Miami to, to shop. Uh, and they certainly didn't have bank accounts in Bank of America or Wells Fargo. So what were you going to do to this country? But the reality is that this country is also a criminal state. They engage in a whole raft of illicit financing, everything from counterfeit cigarettes and drug trafficking uh, to proliferation and the sale of nuclear capabilities. Keep in mind that the Syrian nuclear program that the Israelis destroyed, and which I can now talk about because President Bush wrote about it in his book, um, <laughs> uh, was actually developed by the North Koreans, or the Syrians in concert with the North Koreans. And also, interestingly, they are the best counterfeiters of U.S. $100 bills of anyone in the world, so much so that the Secret Service which was created by President Lincoln, as you know, to deal with the counterfeit rings that were so prevalent during the Civil War. A third of the currency during the Civil War was actually counterfeit. Uh, the Secret Service, which still has that role, uh, calls it the super note because it is such a good replica of genuine currency. And I guarantee you, if I pass the currency around, the super note around, you would not be able to tell the difference. The only folks who can really tell the difference are the Secret Service specialists who can detect the anomalies, as well as sometimes money exchange operators who can slightly feel the difference, right? Feel the slight difference. And in fact, the very first super note was found uh, by a money exchange operator in Manila who felt something different. And so wherever the North Koreans operate diplomatically or commercially, the super note pops up in Peru, in Yemen, in Taiwan, even in Las Vegas. So this is a criminal state. Some of my friends who study North Korea more closely than I do call it the, a mafia state or even the soprano state because they actually like the sopranos. And frankly, as we've seen, they actually act like the sopranos. They, they, don't, uh, they don't suffer fools lightly. Um, but the reality was this was a regime that not only was engaged in all that illicit conduct that I said was inherently uh, 
uh, isolatable by the private sector and uh, government agencies. But they also had financial relationships around the world that were important. And so they had banking relationships, not just in China, but in Macau and Hong Kong, in Mongolia, in Russia, throughout Southeast Asia. They even had their own bank in Vienna called Golden Star Bank, which they used to procure all sorts of luxury items and goods. And so if you looked at the fa financial battle space, North Korea actually had financial dependencies. They actually had an intelligence service called Office 39, they still do, that is charged with raising money for the regime and finding ways of getting it back into Pyongyang. And so they set up front companies. They do all sorts of nefarious things, engage in money laundering to get money back. And so in 2003, we identified one of these banks, a small private bank in Macau called Banco Delta Asia, BDA for short. And what we did was we decided we we're going to isolate this one bank because it was an all-purpose bad bank doing business with the North Koreans, taking the counterfeit, engaging in proliferation, having accounts for Office 39. They were a bad bank. And we were going to isolate it using a treasury tool, a specific treasury tool called Section 311 that allowed the Secretary of the Treasury to say, this is a primary money laundering concern. And we're not going to allow it to do business anymore with the U.S. because of the risks that it poses to the U.S. system. After two years of wrangling with the diplomats to make sure it fit with the six-party talks, with the intelligence services to make sure we weren't revealing anything we shouldn't, with law enforcement, which had all sorts of investigations of organized crime dealings with North Korea, uh, and after a takedown at a New Jersey mob wedding, believe it or not, we then moved forward with this regulation in 2005, a domestic regulatory rule that had international impact. And when that was launched, General Hayden, who was the former head of the CIA and NSA, called it a 21st century version of a precision-guided financial missile. Because what happened was, in isolating that bank, in revealing what it was doing and what the North Koreans were doing, in this environment of reputational risk being at a prim premium, it was like throwing a rock into a pond and watching the ripple effects. Slowly but surely, the North Koreans were isolated, not just from that bank, and that bank was destroyed, a run on the bank, the Macanese Monetary Authority took it over, but also then other banks and actors. And so bank accounts were frozen, transactions were blocked, hard questions were now being asked of North Korean agents that were accessing accounts at certain places. And so the North Koreans, three weeks after that measure was taken, for the first time in modern me memory, called the White House and the State Department first to say, we have a problem, we have to talk. And for two years thereafter, they began and ended every conversation with, we want our money back. And what they really wanted was their access to the financial system back again. It's what the Iranians have wanted in the context of the negotiations as well. Uh, and in fact, it's the, it was the price of reentry to the nuclear talks to unwind that financial pressure. And so how do we use these tools to not only get the attention of the North Koreans, but also to affect their behavior, as well as potentially Chinese behavior with respect to the support of North Korea? That is a core question. And very quickly, with respect to Iran, how does the unwinding of sanctions, which actually brought them to the table, which will be necessary to hold their feet to the fire to adhere to the deal, as well as sanctions that are used to deal with all the other conduct that we care about with respect to Iran, how will those tools be used at a moment where in the JCPOA, the deal, we've promised the reintegration of Iran into the international financial and commercial system? This is where you're beginning to see a divide between these kinds of financial tools and authorities and suasion and the diplomacy that led to the deal. And so this is why major Western banks, which had been sanctioned to the tune of billions of dollars for sanctions violations of doing business with Iran or Sudan or other countries, are unwilling to go into Iran. They're the most risk averse of any of the commercial actors. And it's creating frustration that the Iranian leadership even tweets about the fact that these banks aren't willing to do business, that capital isn't available, that their lack of willingness to go in is slowing progress for other actors, their clients, their customers to go in. It's why, in fact, David Cameron in the UK has made it an open point to try to impel 
uh, these British banks in particular to move in and do business. He just sent an open letter to Barclays Bank the other day uh, recommending and uh, impelling them to go and do business in, in Iran. And so a core question is how do these tools retain their, their power and their influence to hold Iran in check where we need to, but how are they unwo unwound in a smart way as a way of influencing and as a way of preserving this power? It's the same question in the context of Cuba, frankly. How do you unwind the pressure in a way that continues to influence the way that the regime behaves and acts, in particular with respect to human rights? And so that's Iran, and those are key questions. Now, interestingly, these tools are being seen and viewed not just as tools of how we deal with terrorism or terrorist financing or these old issues, but the new issues that are bedeviling the national security uh, complex and uh, intelligentsia. And so the question of how do you deal with malicious cyber activity is now a central question. And before the state visit uh, by the, the Chinese president uh, to the United States, a key question that arose was whether or not the U.S. was going to sanction Chinese entities, in particular state-owned enterprises that have profited from cyber espionage and massive uh, cyber malicious activity. Because of April of last year, April 1st, 2015, President Obama signed a new executive order, a new executive order that looks very much like the executive order that President Bush signed with respect to terrorist financing shortly after 9-11. And this executive order says that cyber malicious activity uh, is a national economic uh, security uh, crisis and emergency. And that these same financial tools of influence and power can be used not just against those that are hacking or exfiltrating data and intellectual property, but also those that are facilitating it or those that are profiting from it or those that are using it for economic advantage. And so just like that executive order in September of 2001 opened the battle space to potentially hold financial institutions and others in the international system to account for dealing, to do, doing business with terrorist groups, now you have an executive order in the cyber context that opens up the possibility that these same powerful financial tools can be used against those profiting from these uh, cyber activities. And in fact, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, has said that this may be the only or the key tool of deterrence in the context of cyber activity. That if actors like Chinese state-owned enterprises, which want to do business in the, in the United States, want access to U.S. capital, want to be seen as legitimate, if they are threatened with the potential use of these tools, that has a way of then tempering their willingness to support or even condone that activity by Chinese entities or even their government. And so much discussion is being had around how these tools can be used to shape the environment in a new cyber domain and where cybersecurity is really at play. And finally, the question that I raise in Chapter 16 of the book and that I alluded to earlier, the reality that this is no longer just the domain of the United States. You can see this in many ways, both tactical and strategic. Tactically, you see this with the reality that other countries now are applying sanctions the way that we have in a very aggressive way to label terrorists or other nefarious actors for purposes of their own financial system. You've seen this with the Sunni Arab states labeling the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. You've seen it with the labeling now by Saudi Arabia of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Uh, and so these other countries, not just countries in the Middle East, but countries like Singapore uh, and Canada, are applying these tools for their own national security purposes and interests. But strategically, you have countries like Russia and China thinking about how they use these tools as well. China, which has been anathema to the very idea of the use of sanctions, part of the reason they've been recalcitrant in the expansion of sanctions regimes at the UN has been sort of this common diplomatic orthodoxy within Chinese politics around uh, the use of sanctions. But even within China, they are now talking about the unilateral use of sanctions. And they've already demonstrated the willingness to use economic resources to their advantage. Uh, in their diplomatic spat with Japan, for example, they restricted the export of rare earth minerals. In one of their spats with the Philippines, they allowed bananas to rot at the dock 
as a way of economically disciplining the Philippines. And they, in concert with the Russians, are thinking about how to create alternative financial institutions to the US-led economic order, the Bretton Woods order, that has so defined the post-World War II economic system. In fact, so much so that the long-term plans of the Chinese seem to be to find ways of displacing the US dollar as the principal and chief trading currency around the world. And you've seen this with the trade deals being made in Central Asia and for the Silk Road project, where the renminbi is now the central currency being used and where Russia and China are developing trade relationships that rely on the ruble and the renminbi and not on the dollar. And so this is a longer term play. Let me finish with this. And I mentioned this in the epilogue. And I think this is important for anybody who's interested in national security, even if you don't care about this part of it. Because I think what we have innovated with the use of these tools and how we have viewed the environment is actually a lesson for how we should be viewing power and its use in national security in the 21st century. That we've used financial power and suasion as a way of influencing the environment, shaping behavior, even deterring in ways that have relied not just on classic elements of national power, but elements of power in an internationalized, globalized, and interconnected system. Because at the end of the day, what has made this power so effective is the fact that the private sector has been an explicit partner and strategic element of unplugging these rogue actors from the financial system. And in a 21st century environment where power is being diff diffused, where super empowered individuals, institutions, NGOs, churches, all have influence and power in environments, where streetcraft ca counts just as much, if not more, as statecraft, then we have to think differently about how power is wielded and how we think about the alignment of these interests and power with our own interests. It's what I call strategic suasion. And what we developed in this field is financial suasion. What we now have to develop as a country is a sense of strategic suasion, the ability to influence national security interests around the world by aligning elements of power that sit outside of our control, but in which they have common interests and common goals. And so I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you read it. And I hope now when you read the newspaper and either read about sanctions or some other national security issue, you'll begin to understand better how these issues now are playing a central role in how key actors in the US as well as abroad are thinking about power, influence, and security. Thank you very much. I know many of you have to go to your next class, but if, if a few of you would like to ask questions, we'll just take a few minutes. We just in, encourage you to make a line uh, so we can get through as many questions as possible. And then, of course, tell us what you're studying and uh, keep your question brief, if you could, please. Certainly. Thanks to everybody who came, by the way. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Collier Beardsley. I study neuroscience. Um, there's a very recent title from Harvard University Press uh, entitled War by Other Means, Geoeconomics and Statecraft by Black, Will, and Harris. Yes. Uh, the press describes it thusly, uh, factors ranging from US bureaucratic politics to theories separating economics from foreign policy leave America ill-prepared for the new era of geo geoeconomic contest. Uh, why the pessimistic view, and, and how would you respond? Um, it's an issue I raised directly in Chapter 16, and I've, I've written some articles on this as well, and, and uh, spoken to Ambassador Blackwell and, and Jennifer Harris. They're, they're great scholars. Um, the, the pessimism lies around the reality that the US is not structured to deal in an environment where the elements of the global capitalist system are combined with uh, elements of national power in a very explicit and direct way. What I described in terms of the use of sanctions was about the closest we get to the use of US power and influence, which is significant, right? But if you look at how China and Russia think about their economic resources and their strategy, they actually think about their financial institutions, the Chinese are explicit about this, as strategic assets of the state. And so they are thinking in a very different way about their national economic uh, 
security and strategy and how they think about their investments, for example, in Africa, how that uh, affects influence uh, and how they combine that with their military power, for example, where Chinese peacekeepers are deployed in concert with where they have economic influence. Great research being done by a scholar in Duke, uh, at Duke about this. And so I think some of the, is what you described as pessimism uh, is concern. It's concern I raised in Chapter 16, which is we need to think differently about a national economic security strategy, which doesn't sort of shift um, American uh, law or standards or even ethos as a way of sort of co-opting the private sector, but does begin to think differently about how we coalesce public and private interests and begin to, to dovetail those interests in a way to affect our, our national security goals. This is an explicit debate in the cyber context, where 80 percent of our infrastructure sits in the hands of the private sector. How do you, how do you then protect national systems? Um, and how does the government do it if it doesn't control those systems? And frankly, we don't want them to control those systems. But if that's the case, what is the model for how we do this? And I think what you've described is all those factors in the range from the very pedestrian and bureaucratic to the very strategic are all questions as to how the U.S. should structure itself and view its, its, its tools and strategy. I'll give you one quick example. There's been this great debate in Congress about Exim Bank and whether or not to fund it or not. What has been lacking in that debate, quite obviously, is how do we think about Exim Bank and other institutions like OPIC, which provide insurance for businesses willing to do business in hard places around the world, how do we, how do we actually think of these as strategic tools, as a bridge between the public and private to align interests? Uh, because the sad reality is that in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we've expended so much blood and treasure, we, we haven't taken economic advantage of the investments that we've made. And I'm not suggesting that we go to war for economic exploitative uh, reasons. But it's also the fact that the Chinese and Russians uh, and others who haven't been a part of securing those environments are taking full advantage, whether it's the mining companies uh, from China in Afghanistan or the oil and infrastructure companies of Russia and China in Iraq. Uh, and so it's a very different way of viewing the world. And I think what this new book suggests is something I've been suggesting for some time, if I can be honest. We need to play a new geoeconomic game. We need to think about new strategies and tools. Uh, and I think this new book is going to impel the new administration, uh, Republican or Democrat, to think uh, hopefully deeply about what that means. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Adam Tolsifer. I'm a junior studying finance. And you talked a lot about the tools the U.S. Treasury used, you know, post 9-11. I'm curious how the recent events, you know, the 2007 recession, um, heightened regulation and stagnant rates, have affected the tools and the strategies that the U.S. Treasury uses now. It's a great question because the, the financial crisis um, was a crisis of trust in the American financial system, mm -hmm. right? And th there was certainly the G20 context, a sense that uh, there needed to be not only greater security around the U.S. and the Western banking system, but that there needed to be diversification of where that power and influence came from. Uh, and you've seen the Chinese slowly sort of take advantage of that, that point of view. Uh, in terms of how the tools have been wielded, I, I think two things have, have happened. One is uh, there's been a, a deeper sense that we need to think strategically about how institutions, whether for prudential reasons or for security reasons, actually form a key part of our security. Uh, so I'll give you an example. There, there are all these now requirements under, under the Basel principles for uh, the amount of capital that institutions need to keep. And so on the prudential side, that has been a sort of a key reform in uh, the Western banking system as to how banks think about their portfolios and, and their security. But also, you now look at the cyber challenge uh, and the dovetailing of cyber and financial warfare, something I've written some articles about recently. And the reality is there's a recognition that financial institutions now are central to this broader financial system that is so core to our economy and to our, our system. And so that recognition has now become a central part of how, for example, the Treasury Department thinks about its regulation and thinks about its dialogue uh, with the private sector. The second part of this is something that I think is important that hasn't been fully realized, but I think is, is critical in this environment. Uh, 
to the extent that there is resentment or uh, an attempt to sort of buck the American-led uh, global economic order, uh, which there is in, in, in many quarters, the reality that the, is that these tools certainly rely on American power and influence and the stability of our markets and the trust in them. But they also rely on the fact that we have made central to them these conduct-based sanctions that rely on international norms that are accepted by all the key actors, to include China and Russia. And so when you talk about sanctions that are wielded for purposes of uh, corruption or money laundering uh, or even proliferation finance, those are all international standards and norms that these countries have actually adopted and uh, agreed to uh, abide by. And so the use of our tools in a way that is driven by these international norms and that actually reinforces these international norms, and you're seeing it play out in the context of corruption in a very significant way now, uh, that then becomes a central way of continuing to drive the tool regardless of how uh, economic power is being diffused uh, in a macro sense. And so the, the use of these norms and these sanctions and these demands and what I would call financial suasion actually is a source of strength for us because these are, these are norms that we actually drive and believe in and requiring that as part of the international system actually then helps define how these sanctions will work. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Matthew Holly. I'm a double econ finance major. Yeah. And kind of getting back on these themes, I mean, to be blunt, we're talking about weaponizing the dollar, essentially. And you use financial suasion as a way to say that. But essentially, we're weaponizing the dollar. The undercurrent of strength behind that is the reserve currency status of the dollar. And by using it this way, we're essentially guaranteeing the demise of the dollar as the reserve currency of the world. What do we look at as far as the implicit cost to our economy as that happens, and how do you think about that? Yeah. It's a great question, and, and one that has now emerged as a, as a fairly open debate in Washington. Because I think one of the concerns, and I do mention in the book, a uh, negative externality of the, the overuse of these tools. I, I think the, the tools used in strategic ways, ways that are understandable in terms of international norms, it won't do damage to uh, the dollar and certainly won't do damage to the sense that the U.S. is driving these, these interests. One example of that, which is slightly outside of the Treasury lane but still important, is the, the FIFA case, the corruption case, yeah. where the U.S. Department of Justice brought these cases against FIFA for corruption. Lots of hooting and hollering around the world as to U.S. intervention into a space where it has very little interest, at least according to the rest of the world, in terms of soccer. Um, but the reality is that the, the facts are the facts, and the norms are norms that are accepted and abided by by the rest of the world. And so despite the notion that the U.S. overreached, was sort of hyper-aggressive with its prosecutorial power in this realm, the rest of the world has followed suit. Uh, and so the Attorney General of Switzerland has an in-depth investigation into FIFA corruption. Uh, folks are looking into what has happened in Russia and Qatar with respect to the bids. South Africa and Brazil have had to look at these issues very closely. Uh, and so the, re the reason I use this example is it's an example of the use of international norms and principles with the use of U.S. prompting and catal catalysts as a way of beginning to affect an international issue and to isolate rogue behavior. That doesn't do damage in the long term to the U.S. dollar, to U.S. Uh, primacy. And in fact, it puts the U.S continuously in a role of defining those norms and principles. So that's, that's one way of, of ensuring that it doesn't become a, a fundamental problem. The second is, you know, the, the dollar is going to uh, survive as a reserve currency largely based on the fundamentals of our economy, first and foremost. I, I think the sanctions question um, can be an accelerant to some of the trends that are already happening in the international system. But I think what's more fundamental to the role of the dollar is the U.S. debt, uh, the functionality of our, of our politics, uh, the attractiveness of our capital markets, the consistency of, of the rule of law, all of these things that are fundamental to why the U.S. is still uh, the place where people around the world want to put their money. It's precisely why we have to worry about money laundering in the, the U.S. It's why the U.S. Treasury, uh, through FinCEN, put out a, a geographic targeting order to look at uh, 
these millions of dollars coming into the New York and Miami real estate markets precisely because it's seen as a retreat uh, from the volatility economically around the world. And so I agree with you, we've got to be very careful because the overuse of these tools, the use of these tools that appear capricious or simply solely based on U.S. unilateral interest begins to accelerate the, the, the desire to create alternate institutions or alternate currencies. But at the end of the day, I think it's a fundamental question as, uh, as to the role of the dollar uh, in terms of the strength of the U.S. economy and the trust um, in our capital markets. That will be the driver as to um, how long the dollar is really uh, the chief reserve currency. Right. Thank you. Jim Brown, I'm a, I'm a finance professor. So you used the example of uh, Iran and the nuclear deal. I am just curious, depending on what media outlet you read, that's either a landmark, uh, you know, awesome deal by the United States government all the way down to a $150 billion giveaway, depending yeah. on kind of what you read. Uh, given your expertise, how do you judge the efficacy of that deal? It's like red meat you're throwing to me. I testified a couple times before Cong uh, the Senate uh, after the deal was made, so I, I, you know, for folks who are interested, I've got testimony on that. But um, in short, um, I don't see a problem with negotiating with Iran. In fact, the Bush administration policy, and, and I, I was fortunate to be a part of some of this in, in the meetings when we were uh, articulating and trying to execute this, had in mind a diplomatic strategy, right? It, it, it was financial pressure aligned then with a diplomatic strategy uh, led by Nick Burns um, as well as by uh, Bill Burns, who was uh, uh, also the Deputy Secretary of Treasury uh, of the state uh, for uh, uh, the Obama administration. So the idea of diplomacy is not anathema. So those who are critical because we've negotiated with Iran, I think, are you know, sort of off base. That's sort of an extreme dimension of the, of the debate. But I do worry about the contours of, of the deal itself. Uh, and so in looking at the deal, I think there are three fundamental problems. One, in terms of sanctions relief, it's too front-loaded. And so the unwinding as a way of, of incentivizing Iran, of course, uh, the incentive was to sort of front-load uh, some of the unwinding and some of the uh, sort of return of capital, for example, is, is, is an example of that. Uh, and so that, that, I think, is problematic because I think the unwinding could have been negotiated in a way where there were ways of, for example, reintegrating Iranian banks without sort of unplugging, uh, plugging them back in sort of wholesale, which is in essence what we've done other than a couple of banks, to actually uh, integrate them back uh, as sort of a, a remediation plan. Or even thinking about, as I argued uh, to the Senate uh, and wrote about, a way of creating a SWIFT-like system for Iranian banks to say, look, you're going to be a little bit of a halfway house because we've said all along that we are su suspect around what it is that you're financing and doing. And oh, by the way, we've got these other sanctions that we're worried about, and your banks are probably going to be used for those purposes. And so why not a monitoring mechanism for the banks as a way of ensuring that we understand what's happening in and out of Iran? Now, to the Iranians, that's perhaps a violation of sovereignty. But frankly, it would also be a way of assuring the private sector. And so if uh, the Western banks, who were reticent to go in, and it was predictable they were going to be reticent to go in, if they knew that there was some sort of mechanism that was blessed by the, uh, by the international community that was actually monitoring what was happening in and out of the Iranian banking system, they actually would probably be more reassured that they could do business and have a counterparty or a correspondent that was Iranian, as opposed to now, where they don't even know who the counterparty is and that they don't know what the controls are. And so I think there were smarter ways of unwinding that would have given this uh, a, a bit more power and a, a bit more of the effect that we wanted. Uh, so that's one, one issue. The second is uh, that we've, we've created, in essence, uh, a legitimacy to an Iranian nuclear program, even in the best case scenario. So at the end of 10, 15 years, uh, assuming Iran abides by the rules and everybody else uh, abides by the deal, Iran is a legitimate nuclear power. And we've actually agreed in that process to facilitate it and to actually not interfere with dimensions of it. Now that's problematic when much of the problem with the Iranian nuclear program to date has been 
the obfuscation and the blending of the civilian nuclear program with the military program. And all of that has not been clarified, frankly. And it's still not clear to me that we're going to have the best visibility moving forward. Now, the hope is that the inspection regime uh, and the deal itself will give some sort of insight and momentum into understanding it and will temper a desire for the Iranians to cheat or to develop a, a nuclear weapon capability. But you've got to you've got to verify. You can't simply trust. And I'm not sure the deal does that well enough. And we've we've shifted the burden of persuasion to use a bit of a, a legal framework for this. Uh, and third, uh, and this was my major concern, I fear that we've negotiated away our ability to use effective sanctions against Iran for all these other purposes at a time when all the experts understand, and as we've witnessed, Iran is going to be s slightly more adventurous. Uh, at a minimum, the Revolutionary Guard is going to want to demonstrate its power and influence. And at a time of great conflict between Su Sunni and Shia forces, and a time of geopolitical contest of power in the Middle East, we're going to need these tools to actually affect the way Iran behaves, or at least as an option. And in agreeing to not interfere with the reintegration of Iran's econ economy and reintegration into the global system, we've in essence agreed to not using these tools aggressively or effectively the way that we once have. As I described earlier, what has made these so effective is not just that we list a bunch of people, some Iranian leaders or some Revolutionary Guard folks, it's that we actually strategized and figured out ways of unplugging key Iranian uh, elements of the economy from that global system. If we've agreed not to do that, and in fact, if we're cheerleading for the exact opposite to happen, we've in essence taken that power off the table for pur purposes of terrorist financing or proliferation financing or ballistic missiles or support to Assad or human rights abuses. How are we to use these tools aggressively and effectively if we've agreed uh, in toto to Iran's integration? And so those are three fundamental reasons. There are other reasons as to why the deal, I think, is flawed. That said, you know, I believe in the good faith of our diplomats. Uh, I know the people who were negotiating this in particular the Treasury folks who are my friends. Uh, and I know that they were trying their best for a good deal. Uh, I just don't think it's as good as it, we could have gotten at a time where the Iranians were incredibly vulnerable and where the sanctions were just beginning to bite in maximalist form and when oil prices were dropping. We had a position of strength that I think we didn't fully utilize in the negotiations. Okay, thank you. My name is Adam McColvin. I am a strategy and economics major. Um, so throughout the talk, you referenced a lot about um, the United States being kind of the standard for the dollar as an international kind of backing of currency. As um, emerging markets like China, um, I mean, what happens if China becomes the big dog on the block? You know, can they start using the same economic warfare against us? What happens if the Chinese dollar becomes the standard, um, especially just as innovative disruption becomes a lot more worldwide and the United States is tending toward consumerism and China is very much focused on uh, producing? It's a great question. And it dovetails back with the question about the, the effects on the dollar, uh, in part because there are already natural uh, economic tendencies uh, that are uh, making the, the use of the renminbi, or the yuan as it's called, it, it, it fluctuates depending on how you refer to it domestically or internationally, but uh, the renminbi is already being used simply because of the size of the Chinese economy. And so a lot of this is happening naturally. Uh, the diversification of uh, currency reserves beyond the dollar was already a trend that was happening internationally, uh, even before the financial crisis. Um, and so these are natural tendencies happening in a global economic order that's, that's shifting. Uh, and that's, that's fine. Uh, the question is, and it's an appropriate one, what if the Chinese begin to think about their economy, their resources, and their currency in the same way that, that we have, or at least the way I described it? And the reality is they are. They already are. Um, and uh, they're, they're, in my estimation, and we're doing a, a good bit of study about this, uh, and more and more in the U.S. government, there's interest in thinking about how China is using its influence. Um, the Chinese are engaged in, in, in three different pathways. One is the more tactical. 
as I described, sort of the, the use of its resources and influence in very tactical ways. Uh, can they demand more of foreign institutions coming in that allows them to gain IP and then later market share? Uh, can they use the export of rare earth minerals as a way of tweaking and constricting Japan? So very tactical uses and even maybe even the use of unilateral sanctions in certain instances. And they've had this debate in the context of North Korea as well, uh, how they use their influence, especially when North Korea has relied so deeply on the Chinese economy uh, as, a, as a backstop for, for their regime. And so that's tactical. Um, second is how they affect uh, and play in the existing order. Uh, and so uh, China is, is gaining more uh, prominence, obviously, given the size of its economy, but it's playing more of an institutional role. So you saw the adoption of the renminbi as part of a currency at the IMF as part of the special drawing rights, how they calculate, uh, how the IMF calculates its, its loans and its, its uh, interactions. The renminbi is now in that pantheon of currencies as part of it. They're playing more of a role institutionally in the G20 context post the financial crisis. So e even in the current order, they are playing more of a, of a, of a quiet role uh, a, a, and an important role through their economy. Finally, they're playing a longer game, I think, which is a recognition that their economy is going to actually be a natural engine for increasing their power in this domain. But they're all already planting seeds of alternate institutions outside of the US-dominated role. And so this debate of the AIIB, this alternate development bank in Asia, is a case in point where they're trying in some way to create an alternate institution that benefits their economy, but also increases their influence in terms of uh, development aid and, and, uh, and, and loans. That's an alternative to the Japanese and American-led uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, and so they're playing a longer game in terms of establishing these institutions that can form an al alternative that will benefit the Chinese economy directly and allow them to influence. And so your, your question is spot on because China is already there. They're already thinking in, the, in these terms and as we talked about, already have a national economic strategy that has a, a short-term component and a long-term dimension. I might clarify one point. So specifically, if you know it's happening, but what happens if China decides to use sanctions against us long-term? Well, they've already threatened it. For example, in, in the case of Taiwan, over the last uh, five, six years, every time the U.S. renews its deals uh, to, to sell military equipment, especially high-end military equipment to Taiwan, the Chinese have uh, rattled uh, their economic sabers uh, and said, we're going to begin to uh, sanction U.S. companies that want to do business in China that have some relationship to uh, these deals with Taiwan. Um, they, they've already done it in other contexts as well, and they, in fact, have alluded to this in the context of retaliation for the use of the cyber executive order that I mentioned um, as retaliation. And it certainly has become part of the dialogue with the use of these tools to say, look, we can be as, as aggressive and creative as we want, uh, but there's two sides to the story. And when you're talking about another major economy, whether it's Russia or, Russia or China, you've got to be more delicate and more strategic about the use because these are economies and countries that can bite back. Uh, and so it's already happening in some interesting ways. Thank you. One, just a quick question. Um, the real using the Iran sanctions as an example and operating from the premise that until the EU sometime after 2010 decided that it would enforce its own sanctions, our leverage over the Iranian nuclear program was virtually non-existent. The basic idea being that in military strategy as well as in economic strategy, the United States' ability unilaterally to achieve objectives in the world is really quite limited, that we do in fact need the cooperation of others. And, and when you were answering the gentleman's question about the Iranian nuclear program, we could have negotiated, we could have done. The we in that question yeah. actually is six different countries. Right. Right. And um, one, I, I guess that's, that's really the point to, to, to underscore, because in a U.S. presidential election year, the last thing we're going to hear any politician yeah. talk about is that the United States really can't do it all 
by itself. So could you, in this maddening, yes. simplistic environment we find ourselves in, just talk about the importance of international um, cooperation, how it, the challenges, but the, the positive aspects that come from having to cooperate with other nations in order to get deals like the Iranian nuclear deal. Yeah. Fred, you're absolutely right. And I didn't mean to suggest in any way in my remarks that uh, international cooperation wasn't important. And in fact, what I was trying to emphasize moving forward with this notion that our actions have to be tied to international norms that are well understood is in part uh, a direct reflection of what you're describing, which is our actions have to be uh, not only strategic, but they have to be legitimate. And if, if they're legitimate and if they're done in concert with other actors, be they the private sector or other governments or international institutions like the UN, they will have much greater impact and effect. Um, on the Iran nuclear deal, you're absolutely right. It was a, a collection of, of countries. But even in that context, you had countries like, like France that were willing to hold uh, harder lines on these issues than we were. And so by we, you're absolutely right, it was a collective, but it was also, I think, the U.S. that was driving toward uh, a quicker and more immediate deal in a way that actually frustrated some of our allies. And so in a way, some of our diplomacy actually can be hyper-unilateral as well at times. Uh, and the reality is our allies rely on us, as Fred, you know, you, you, you know, you are the you know, principal diplomat in, on so many issues in the Middle East and other, other uh, domains. You know, they rely on the U.S. to actually set the standards and to drive the framework for these issues. And uh, that becomes a, a key sort of threading of the needle between hyper-unilateralism and this sort of simplistic notion that the U.S. can affect everything at all times around the world and a uh, sort of hyper sense that uh, we have to sort of wait for others to define the environment first. And I think it, it, there's a happy medium there. And I think the, the use of these tools has been a, a, a reflection of that, where we, we have been able to use unilateral tools to shape the environment, uh, but it has been then in concert with other actors in the international system where they've grown incredibly effective. And you're absolutely right, the European Union, in what they did with respect to the oil trade, uh, became a, a, a sort of the, the nail in the coffin in terms of the isolation of Iran um, and that kind of cooperation becomes essential. We've seen this with North Korea. You need China to make any of these tools actually have teeth and leverage. You need China to play a role and a constructive role. Uh, and how that plays out becomes part of this financial diplomacy, which is now so core to how we think about our influence. 